watching the world burn, watching the world burn, July 12th, 2024, let's get into it. Now, if you follow me on YouTube, I'm that cybersecurity guy, so I guess the big news story for me of the day, being a cybersecurity dude, or I was anyway, was that uh, AT&T just had a massive breach, a massive hack. You know, but that's not the worst part about it. I mean, it's the fact that they were hacked, number one, is a disgrace. We we have no cybersecurity in this country. And believe me, I work for these corporations. And the reason we don't have cybersecurity is that the IT department is considered an expense. Okay? They're considered an expense. They're not an asset of the corporation. And that's why they they get the dumbest, stupidest people to do their cybersecurity because they don't have to pay them very much. Or they import them. A lot of them are from India or all these other foreign nations. I mean, do you think they really care about doing cybersecurity for an American company when their family lives in India and their allegiance is to India? You know, or from China, for example? I mean, good God. AT&T customer, you got to listen to this. The company just revealed that nearly all of its customers, more than 100 million people, have been hit by hackers in a massive data breach, exposing their text messages and their phone logs. Joining us now, NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chug. This is awful. Yeah, it's a big deal. And basically what AT&T disclosed this morning is that during a period between May and uh, roughly the end of October in 2022, uh, basically all phone calls and text messages were accessed illegally by some bad actor. Now, for what's worth, uh, AT&T says that the contents of phone calls and text messages were not included in the breach, but merely the text uh, numbers that you reached out to or basically whoever you were calling or texting, uh, those numbers were identifiable. And even though there's no personal... Why are they confident of that? Well, that's what they say. Again, we're looking into this and law enforcement officials are working with AT&T to try to figure out the nature of exactly what happened here. They do say that one person was apprehended. At least one person was apprehended. But law enforcement officials are continuing to work with not just AT&T, but the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, in investigating exactly what happened. So what are they telling customers about what to do in the face of this? Well, they're telling customers to just be aware of any sort of unusual activity. If you get any sort of spam or phishing messages by email, it could be linked to this information that one was illegally accessed, but they also say that they're working uh, quickly to try to resolve the vulnerability that was related in this instance, and then also advising customers that they'll provide any, that they'll provide any updates. So they got text messages, phone logs, any indication that they got emails or any uh, info like that? Yeah, so it's just it just seems to be limited to phone calls and text messages, and again, the contents were, according to AT&T, not allegedly part of that. So basically, let's say, for example, there's a text message between me and my mom. They saw the phone numbers that were involved in that particular exchange, but they don't know what was said or exchanged, but again, we don't know what's been done with this information. Uh, we don't know if this is being, you know, released or sold somewhere. Yeah. Regardless, someone accessed this illegally, and they're trying to look into it. All right, Brian Chung, Brian, thank you very much. So anyway, the uh, everybody's information. What did they say? Like a hundred million records, but that's not the worst part. That's not the worst part. If, if I heard correctly on the radio today, the breach actually happened in 2022. I, I said, no, nah, that can't be. And I could be wrong. Don't don't hold me my feet to the fire on that. But if that's true, that means for two years, people didn't even know that they'd been hacked. Oh, my God. If that's true, I, I got to check that out when I get home. But that's what I heard. I thought I heard on the radio. Uh, so that was the big story for me of the day. Uh, the next one is, uh, this is actually a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, Maloney, you know, the, the uh, what would she be, the president of, of Italy or the prime minister, I guess? I don't know. You never know whether it's prime minister or president or whatever. Uh, but anyway, you know, she was a huge disappointment. I don't know if you recall back when she got elected, she gave this huge fiery speech that was awesome. I mean, I thought for sure she was going to be the Victor Orban of Italy, you know. And then she turned into, out to be a globalist. I mean, she's a bit better than somebody like Schultz, but she's a huge disappointment. I mean, she does somewhat look out for Italy, but she's a globalist, or she's at least a globalist sycophant because she sucks up to him. But I wanted to show this video. <laughs> this is her and Joe Biden. Check this out. Please, 
please, Joe. Please, don't sniff my hair. Don't sniff my hair, Joe. Please, get away from me, Joe. Get away. Don't put your hands on me. Don't put your hands on me, Joe. Isn't that what that video says to you? <laughs> I was laughing. I go, you know, every now and then you get a video, and I was just laughing my ass off when I saw that. I thought that was that was the next uh, the next story. We'll keep moving on here. The um, oh, this was a, a, another story I didn't know, and it's verified now for sure. This, is, but uh, you know, Orban wasn't well received at the NATO uh, 75th summit, and in fact, I don't even think he stayed for the whole summit. I guess the you know they pretty much uh, I would imagine he got such a cold reception. He says, you know what, I'm wasting my time here at the summit, and so he flew down to Mar-a-Lago. And met with Trump. Now, Hungary's prime minister has met with Donald Trump in Florida following the NATO summit in Washington. And the Hungarian leader previously met with Zelensky in Kiev, Putin in Moscow, and even Xi Jinping in Beijing. He says he's on a peace mission to end the Ukraine conflict. Now, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban posted on social media that and, and Trump discussed ways to restore peace between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Now, Trump has expressed intentions to end the conflict if he's once again elected to be the U.S. president. Uh, some European powers, however, have openly condemned Orbán's tour. Now, Germany went as far as to say that Orbán's actions have caused collateral damage. We must see how Hungary's chairmanship in the EU Council will proceed in the future. We are now on day 12 of the Hungarian chairmanship, and it has already left behind a lot of collateral damage. I think the EU ambassadors in Brussels have once again appealed to the Hungarian side to stop its attempts at obstruction and to fulfill its role as an honest broker in line with the EU's loyalty. Hungary, Orban, takes the helm of the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union, so all the ministers of all the EU member states, and Orban ends up seizing that opportunity to run all around the globe talking to people with views that actually diverge from the EU establishment. Russian President Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping in China, and now former and potential future US President Donald Trump this week during a trip to the US for the NATO summit. Effectively demonstrating a bit of tolerance and openness to ideological diversity, to supposedly Western democratic values. And he's apparently writing up these discussions in confidential reports to European Council President Charles Michel and also other EU brass, doing the job that none of them could be bothered to do because they're too busy virtue signaling Europe into more and more conflicts. And the EU establishment promptly freaks out about it all. Mr. Orban does not represent neither NATO nor EU's position. It could seem that he's abusing his position as a, as a presiding country, but in no way he's representing neither my country nor the, uh, nor the European Union. As an EU member, I do have a message, along with many other EU leaders. I think he should be careful not misusing the presidency for doing trips that could be considered or be looked upon as, as, uh, as speaking for the, for the whole of EU. I think that is a, that is a mistake, and I think uh, uh, Hungary now they receive the reactions they actually uh, have asked for. Well, these guys sound a little bit triggered. Clearly, Orban is ruining their little safe space. There are now reports coming out of the Western press that the EU establishment wants to punish Orban for his outreach efforts and uh, threatening its six-month rotating mandate. Quick, someone actually is doing some work over here. Can't have that. When French President Emmanuel Macron had this same gig during the six-month French rotating presidency, he had a logo made that looked like it incorporated a stylized version of his initials E and M. Really groundbreaking stuff. Did absolute wonders for the lives of Europeans. The only ones who were allowed to get anything done of substance in Brussels are unelected Queen Ursula von der Leyen and her bureaucratic battalion who make and write policy that get shoved in front of EU lawmakers 
And well, they aren't actually democratically accountable to any voters themselves. Anyway, Orban and his team really don't seem too phased by all of this drama right now. War supporters in Brussels are against Hungary's peacekeeping mission, so they are now attacking Hungary's European Union chairmanship and the Hungarian prime minister himself. Peace is necessary, and for the sake of peace, we must act. While Orban's EU establishment critics are having a meltdown, one thing that he does have on his side is that his six-month rotating presidency may be over before the EU ever gets around to figuring out what the heck to do with him, and especially on what grounds, like where in his job description does it actually say that he can't go on fact-finding missions in favor of peace? Guess they're not used to someone actually doing something useful in this particular role. And uh, boy, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to know what they talked about. I mean, I would imagine if we talked about Orban's visit to China and his visit to Russia and, you know, maybe uh, the peace proposal that that Putin probably uh, gave to Orban, you know, and, uh, and discussed all the you know, Ukraine. I don't know for sure. The only thing we know for sure that was discussed was the election. And Orban told Trump that Hungary's elections are much more secure than the United States. <laughs> so even foreign countries know that we have rigged elections. You know, I, I love it when the Democrats go, oh, no, no, the Americans aren't leg rigged. We're just registered near the illegal immigrants. Oh no, the elections aren't rigged. We just found 300,000 ballots that we can't account for. Oh no, the elections aren't rigged. We, we want mail-in ballots. Oh no, the elections aren't rigged. You have no standing. You have no standing in the courts. No standing to say that the election was rigged. I mean, my God, if it's not obvious to you now, we have the most insecure elections in the world. We're a third, we're a third world country, man, when it comes to elections, thanks to the Democrats. And, uh, what, you know, like I said, good news is uh, I think Georgia's going to do something about Fulton County because uh, they were trying to rig the election again. And uh, they, I don't think they're going to let them do it this time. But we'll see, you know. Georgia Kemp, is a, he's a Democrat, and so his, his uh, I don't know, would that be his secretary of state that heads up the elections? What's that guy's name? Uh, that weasel? Can't remember his name. Uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's that story. So getting back to the election again. The uh, Dominion voting machines in, I think it's Colorado, uh, a case has come out that yes, they uh, can be hacked, yes, they are connected to the internet uh, against state law, yes, uh, Dominion voting machines have been uh, shown definitively to uh, rig votes, uh, count, count uh, change, change, change votes in the machine, so now uh, that's all coming out in Colorado. So. We, I guess all those stories about Dominion voting machines being uh, corrupt <laughs> are true. I wouldn't put my vote in a damn Dominion voting machine unless that's the only thing I had available. So that was one story. Uh, you know, I always got to talk a little bit about um, Gaza. Uh, there's a story that just came out that 70% uh, of the uh, buildings in Gaza have been destroyed. So they're saying that it's no longer... A livable place uh, for human beings so the Israelis have done their job uh, well they've done their job in that fact that the Palestinians can never live in Gaza again uh, the ones that are left I, I think they're they're still exterminating them in vast numbers uh, you know like I said I think we're 186,000 that's the official number I think it's more like a million dead Palestinians so that gives them a, they got about another 1.2 million that they got to kill and the Christians in the United States they want all the Palestinians dead all right if you're a Christian I don't know why you want that but uh, that's what you want I would think the Muslims wouldn't want that but uh, and the Houthis are doing something about it and the, and the uh, uh, also uh, um, Hezbollah you know so there there are some Arabs that are fighting the Israelis to try to help out the Hamas uh, in their fight against Israel. And like I reported uh, two videos ago, I think, was we now know that the IDF was responsible for more than half the deaths on October 7th with their Hannibal Directive. I put that in a previous video if you didn't know that. So a lot of the Israeli propaganda that came out about cutting the heads off of babies and women being raped and all that, uh, I, I, I've seen no proof of the babies. We did have one video I saw of a woman looked like they had her clothes half off. I don't know about that. Um, but from what I understand, I mean, the, the, you got to remember they weren't in Israel very long before, because especially with the Hannibal Directive. So I, I don't think they had a, Hamas had a whole lot of time to be raping women. 
you know, it takes a while to, to get on top and, and do your thing, you know, so, because uh, I think they were too busy being shot at and running, <laughs> and then they had a military mission, remember, they gathered a lot of intelligence, so they hit those Israeli military bases, so that was the, uh, another story, uh, so a couple stories about China real quick, uh, you know, while we were uh, in continuous wars for the past 30 years, spending all our money on that, China has been improving their infrastructure, and I, uh, the first thing is they've actually surpassed the United States in green energy now with uh, their solar development, solar panel development, and also their uh, wind, uh, wind turbines. But I'm much more interested in the solar. I don't think those wind turbines are effective, uh, you know, because if the wind ain't blowing, you're screwed, you know. I mean, and I understand if it's a cloudy day, the solar panels aren't going to work. But, you know, I don't know. Here, there, and there are places where they're going to work. I mean, like here in Florida, my electric bills are down to 30 to $35 a month. Because my solar panels are generating enough electricity and I'm running the damn air conditioning here in Florida it's been hot man I don't know if you can tell but I'm completely soaked out here with nature and uh, so that's uh, that was uh, one big story out of China and then they also have a new and this is insane man they are those you know they're rolling electric vehicles off the assembly line in a fully automated plant I mean can you imagine I mean I can't I never believed that we, I mean, not a single, well, I mean, the people obviously are there to maintain the robots, but the, the whole process from, from A to Z of putting the car together is an automated line. They put together an automated plant. scary when you think about it you know I mean we're getting getting the human humans out of the equation I mean you know pretty soon I don't know if you've seen them robots that roll around the fast food restaurants because you know California wanted to pay a $20 minimum wage and it's a lot cheaper to have a robot roll up to a table with the food than than have a person do that you know and pretty soon we'll have robots behind the counter to take your money or you know I mean it's more and more, I mean, I don't know how the poor people, I, and all these illegal aliens, that was another story that I heard on the radio, and where was it at? It's in Ohio, and I didn't know, I mean, it must be a sanctuary city in Ohio, I got to get the name of it, I'll put that up above, and it uh, starts with an S. Anyway, they had 20, the population there was 60,000, and they got 20,000, Biden put 20,000 illegal immigrants and it's bankrupt in the city. Their hospitals are overflowed. And now they're going to, and they're saying they don't have the money, but they're going to try to build housing for the illegal aliens. Mayor of Springfield, Ohio, and Brian Heck is the city manager, and they both join me now. Uh, good morning to you both. Mayor Rue, tell us what's going on in Springfield. Well, what we've seen is just such a quick increase of our population over the last five years. You know, like you said, up to 15 to 20,000 immigrants have come across uh, and into our community. Uh, this has overwhelmed our safety services and caused great concern for our community. Brian, you're the city manager. Tell us more and how, it, how this influx is impacting the city. Yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you for having us on this morning. You know, when we see a 25% increase over a three-year period, we're a community, we do not have the capacity to, to sustain that. And it's taxing our infrastructure. It's taxing public safety, it's taxing our schools, it's taxing health care, and as J.D. Vance uh, spoke on, it's taxing our housing. We had a housing shortage well before uh, this immigration crisis that's uh, impacted our community, um, and this has just made it a hundred times worse. And so uh, it's setting communities like Springfield up to fail, and uh, we do not have the capacity to sustain it, and uh, without additional federal assistance or support, um, again, communities like Springfield will fail. Just do what, Ohio, man, you're supposed to be a Republican state. Put those illegal aliens on buses and send them to Chicago, man. Send them to New York. They want them. Send them to San Francisco. Don't keep them in Ohio in this small town and try to feed them and house them and send them to school and overrun your hospitals. Come on, Ohio. Get a, get a, get a, get a doodad, man. Get a doodad. I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be Vice President, but I think she was not qualified to be President. 
So let's start there. Number one, the fact is that <clears throat> the consideration, and now I want to hand it over to the president of Ukraine, who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. I'm a president. President Putin. He's a big president Putin. President Zelensky. You can run on for a long time, run on for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Go tell that globalist liar, that Democrat idiot writer, that rhino rambler, that nuclear war gambler, that backbiting U.S. politician. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down.